John 20, I want to read John's account of what Mark said in three verses. I've entitled the message for this evening, Rabboni. That is what Mary called the Lord. It's only used twice in the scripture. The other time, Bartimaeus called him Rabboni. And it's a name that can only be addressed to Jesus of Nazareth. My great Lord. John chapter 20, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark under the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. I love the way John always refers to himself that way. I, there's no better thing than to be the disciple that Jesus loved. He didn't say the disciple that loved Jesus. He called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. She saith unto them, they've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they've laid him. Peter, therefore, went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher, so they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and come first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. Then come a Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. I love that detail. I don't know what all it means, but I love that detail. Verse 8, Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away into their own home, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, and she had no concept of the fact that Christ had been raised from the dead. She was weeping in sorrow. She thought his body had been stolen. And she didn't know what to think of this. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? I can almost uh, hear in that question, what are you weeping for? He's risen. He's risen. Why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom Seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. 
Jesus saith unto her, Mary. I don't know of anything that I desire more greatly than him to say to me, Todd, what could be better than that? For him to know my name. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, my great Lord, my great master, Lord Christ, is how one man translated this Rabboni. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. And we know from Mark's account, they believed her not. Now hold your finger in John chapter 20. We're going to be coming back there and go back to Mark chapter 16. Verse 9, now when Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week. And here's something I also love to try to picture in my mind, though I know I can't do it. I love to think of the Lord laying in the tomb dead. Graveyard dead. A lifeless corpse. And all of a sudden, he lives. What a glorious thought. He was dead. He lives. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now, who can even imagine what a miserable life this woman had? She was demon-possessed, and she was possessed by seven devils. That number means she was completely possessed. She had such a miserable life. And I don't read, we don't know that she ever asked the Lord for mercy. But the Lord came to her. And that's the way he came to you. He first came to you without you asking. He came to me without me asking. He came to me the way he came to Mary Magdalene, possessed with seven devils under the complete dominion of those devils. No way she could deliver herself from those devils and he cast them out. I love to think about that. How this special woman loved him. He that has been forgiven much loveth much. Is there anybody in this room right now that hadn't been forgiven much? I dare say every one of us have been forgiven much. He that's been forgiven much loveth much. And she went and told them 
that had been with him as they mourned and wept. They were heartbroken over the Lord being dead. They did not know that he was raised from the dead. And they mourned and they wept. And she comes as an eyewitness and says, he lives. He spoke to me. He said my name. He made himself known to me. And the scripture says they believed not. Now, we're going to talk more about this when we get into verse 14, when he appears unto the eleven, as they said at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after that he was risen. Every report they heard, they didn't believe. As a matter of fact, Luke's account says they counted them as idle tales when they heard these reports. Now, why did they not believe? There are two explanations for their unbelief. And there are two explanations for my unbelief and your unbelief. Number one, sinful nature. You and I, even if the Lord has saved us, still have the old man. And do you know something the old man has never done? He's never believed. You have an old man even now that does not believe. Faith is impossible for the flesh. I love what that man said in Mark 9. I believe, and I do. Help thou mine unbelief. It's always there. And they didn't believe the report of Mary Magdalene. And the first reason is because of their sinful nature And as we read in John's account, they yet knew not the scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. And there's the reason behind unbelief, not knowing the scriptures. This book is so powerful. It's so awesome. This is the word of God. And these men at this time did not really know the scriptures. Now they would. I know that Peter on the a day of Pentecost, he preaches the scripture, Psalm 16, saying he must rise from the dead. But at this time, he didn't understand. You see, you and I and Peter and everybody else will not understand until he opens our understanding that we might understand the scriptures. Now turn back over to John chapter 20, that passage we just looked at. Verse 1, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and she comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, they've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. Now, she was wrong, wasn't she? (laughs) Nobody took the Lord out of the sepulchre. He was raised from the dead. And he walked out in the omnipotence of his person. But she saw it as, I guess, grave robbers coming and taking him away for some reason. They've taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they've laid him. Peter, therefore, went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher, so they both ran together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. Most people think that John was probably about 18 years old at this time, quite a bit younger than Peter. And one of the things I love to think about is an 18-year-old used the Lord revealing himself to him for the glory of God, 18 years old. And he was in better shape than Peter, I guess, a younger man. He outran him, but he didn't have that bold um, demeanor of Peter. 
He got there first, and he stopped. And he looked in, but he wouldn't go in. He had a lot more uh, timidity to him than Peter. But old Peter, he acts in character. He bolts in. Verse 6, Then come a Simon Peter following him, and he went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. Now the Lord had grave clothes that he removed. And there's something very special about verse 7, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now I know there's a lot of significance to that. I, I, I don't know what it is, so um, anybody knows they can tell me about it afterwards, but uh, at any rate, I love it. Just thinking of him taking this stuff off, folding it up, putting it aside, he's risen. Verse 8, Then went in also the other disciple which came to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now, I love that language. He must. It is absolutely necessary that he rise from the dead. Let me give you three reasons why he must rise from the dead. Number one, because the Bible said he would. Do you have that view of the scriptures? I hope you do. I hope I do. I believe I do. That we believe that whatever God says in his word is so. It's necessary. This is the word of God. He must rise from the dead. Secondly, because who he is. He's the son of God. It was not possible, Peter said on the day of Pentecost. It was not possible that he should be holding of death. He's the son of God. It was not possible for him to stay. He must rise from the dead because of who he is. And thirdly, he must rise from the dead because of what he accomplished. You see, the moment he died, every sin of every believer was put away. And they were all justified and there was no reason for him to stay dead. All sin was gone. He actually put away sin. Now, believer, think about that. Your sin is not. It's not. Then the disciples, verse 10, went away again into their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, tears of sorrow, no doubt, uh, distraught over what had taken place with the body of the Lord, not having any understanding of what had taken place. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain, but was no longer there. He was risen. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Well, she was weeping because she didn't know the Christ was risen from the dead. She thought he's still dead. She thought some grave robbers had come and taken his body away. And she was distraught. That's why she was weeping. Her reply, Woman, why weepest thou? She said, Because they've taken away my Lord. And I know not where they have lain him. No, they haven't taken away the Lord. He rose from the dead. She was wrong. But she was wrong. You know, when I thought of this verse of Scripture, I thought this would be a very accurate description of most of what goes on under the name of preaching. They've taken away my Lord. He's not in it. And I don't know 
where they have laid it. But here she is weeping. Verse 14. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back. She turned around. Now, what would have made her turn around when she was looking at these two angels? I think perhaps they beckoned to her. Look behind you. I don't know that. But for some reason, she turned around. Even while she was speaking to these two angelic beings in white, something must have happened that caused her to turn around. But she turned around while they were speaking. And she saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Many reasons have been given as to why she didn't know it was Jesus. I've heard this explanation because she was so filled with tears she couldn't see clearly. That could have been the case. I don't think it's what it is, but that could have been. Others have said the last time she saw him, he was in such a gruesome state. And now she sees him in a glorified body. And she doesn't recognize him because of the splendor and the majesty and the glory of his person. That could be the case. But I personally think she couldn't see him for the same reason that those two on the road to Emmaus couldn't see him. It says their eyes were holding so that they didn't know him. The Lord made it to where she did not know who he was. And look what it says about her. Verse 15, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? That's the same thing the angel said, but he added something to it. Whom seekest thou? What a question. Who are you seeking? A better version of yourself? Who are you seeking? I hope my only answer is him who loved my soul, the Lord Jesus Christ. Any other answer is no good. Seek and you shall find. And that's talking about seeking him. Seek and you shall find shall find woman whom seekest thou and look at her answer she supposing him to be the gardener the fellow that worked there that took care of the grounds now anytime we suppose something that means it's something that came from us it's not something that came from revelation where he's taught us we're just making a supposition. And any time we make a supposition, we always make him lower than he is. She supposed him to be the gardener. Sir, verse 15, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary. Now this, put your name there. If you're a believer, he has called you by name. He knoweth his own sheep and calleth them by name. Now, you may not have heard your name audibly, but you've heard him call you when you've heard the gospel and know it's the truth of God. When that is the case, that's him calling your name. I love what Paul said in Galatians 4, 9. He says, now that you've known God, or rather are known of God. Now, that's... I want to know him. Now, I, I do. I want to know him. I, I don't want to go through the motions of religion and miss him altogether. I want to know him. There's only one thing I want more than to know him, and that's for him to know me. Oh, I want him to know me. He knows my name. 
I was one of the people that he represented. Mary, he knew her. This is what the effectual call is. Lazarus, come forth. He that was dead came forth. Zacchaeus, don't you reckon Zacchaeus was shocked when he heard his name? Zacchaeus, me, make haste, come down. For today I must abide in thy house. Mary, one that I know, Mary, loved by me with an everlasting love. Mary, one that I kept God's holy law for. Mary, one whom I bore her sins and put them away forever. One I died for. Mary, one I'm making myself known to. Mary. And you know how I know that she knew it was the Lord? By her response. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, my great Lord. My great master. That's what Bartimaeus said when the Lord said to him, what would you that I should do unto you? He said, Rabboni. You see, he could hear his voice. He couldn't see him. But he heard his voice. He knew who he was. And he said, Lord, grab on me that I might receive my sight. Now, when Mary responded to her name being called, there was only one response. And this is the response of every single child of God. Rabboni. This name does not go to anyone else. It's exclusive only to him. Oh, fairer is he than all the fair that fill the heavenly train. Majestic sweetness sits enthroned upon the Savior's brow. His head with radiant glories crowned. His lips with grace o'erflow. No mortal can with him compare among the sons of men. Fairer is he than all the fair who fill the heavenly train. You see, she knew who he was. And listen to me. This is what faith is. It's knowing who he is. She gave the right response. Rabboni, my great Lord. And he is the Lord, isn't he? He's the Lord of creation. I love thinking about it. I, I, you know, I, at least once or twice a week, maybe more than that, I start thinking about the universe. Maybe that's weird, I don't know, but I just start thinking of the vastness of the universe. I think how many stars are there, how many galaxies. And some people say it's expanding, some people say it's contracting, I don't know. But I know this, he spake it into existence as an act of his own will. Jesus of Nazareth created the universe. He's the Lord, I love thinking about this. He's the Lord of providence. That means everything that takes place, he's in control of. Everything. If you leave out anything, then he's not Lord of all. He's Lord of everything. He's Lord of salvation. If I'm saved, it's because he willed my salvation. I love the way Peter said when he came to those people from Cornelius, peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. My great. Lord. Verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not. Now he is not saying, because uh, my glorified state, you're unable to touch me. I'm sure that's not what he said. I think of him, I'm sure he touched many of the disciples during that 40 day period and hugged them and kissed them and whatever else he did with him, and he ate bread with him. Uh, he's not saying, you can't touch me, but here's the scene I see. 
Mary has her arms wrapped around his waist, wrapped around his feet. She does not want him to go. She wants to be in his presence. She's so overcome with that. She's so happy with that. She's got her arms maybe wrapped around his feet. Don't go. Don't go. I want to be with you. I don't want you to leave me. Don't leave. And he said, let go of me. Let go of me. Release me. Because I've got a mission for you. I'm not yet ascended to my father. Now, he's not going to ascend to his father for another 40 days. And she didn't understand. That upon the Lord's ascension, and I don't much understand this either, uh, but the Lord says it's expedient for you that I go, for if I go not, the Comforter won't come to you. And somehow, we have more of the Lord's presence by His Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of regeneration, than we would if we had Him physically. He said, it's expedient for you that I go. The Comforter will come to you. God the Holy Spirit will come to you. And that's what the Lord said. And he said, I've not yet ascended to my Father. But look what he says. This is the me message he has. I'm not yet ascended to my Father, but you go to my brethren. And that's where I want to stop for a moment. What's he call them? My brethren. He doesn't call them the folks who ran out on me when... They should have been staying with me at the cross and were in hiding. He doesn't call them my servants. He calls them my brethren. You see, the great end of predestination, for whom he did foreknow, remember that, whom he did foreknow. Not what, whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate that he might be, that they might be conformed to his image, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's a special word, isn't it? The brethren. God counts all his people. Christ counts all his people his brethren. <laughs> Both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Now, union with Christ, the Lord gives the closest, closest example that we could possibly grasp, if we can grasp it, the vine and the branches. The same stem that runs through the vine runs through the branches. One with Christ. There's no connecting point. There's no time. The same stem that runs through the vine runs through the branches. Both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for the which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Do you know there's nothing about you that Christ is ashamed of because you're one with him. You're united to him. You're his brother. You're his sister. My brethren. He's our elder brother. Go to my brethren. And what is he going to tell him? What does he tell her to say to them? You go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father. And I ascend unto my God and your God. Now here is what comes out of the Lord ascending back to his father. He said, I'm ascending to my father and your father. You know, we're taught to pray our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
He said, if you then, being evil, the Lord didn't pull, pull any punches, did he? Of course not. He's the Lord. If you then, being evil, don't you know what he's saying when he says that? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good gifts to them that ask him? Then shall the righteous shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He's my father. He's your father. You go to my father and your father, and I'm going to my God and your God. Now, he's everybody's God by way of creation. He's everybody's God by way of his sovereign right and rule. Nobody says, you're not my God. Yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh, he's got you completely. Uh, but he's not everybody's God in the saving sense where he says, I'll be to them a God. And they shall be to me a people. So that we can say, if God be for us, who can be against us? Now, Mary, don't hold on to me. You go and tell my brethren, and who they are, they're my brethren, that I send to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she'd seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. He said, she said to them, he said he's going back to his father and our father. He's our father too. And he's going back to his God and he's our God too. And John, for some reason, graciously leaves out the part about them not believing her. <laughs> but we're going to look at that, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks. But what a Rabboni. Can I say from my heart to him, Rabboni, my great Lord. Let's pray. Lord, accept this through your merits and your intercession and your mediation. But Lord, we say, Rabboni, our, my, great Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen.